All right. So today we have Shlomo Razavat tell us about star-shaped quivers in four dimensions. Take it away. Okay. Thank you very much, Julius. So uh, indeed, I will talk about star-shaped quivers in four dimensions, and it is based on a short paper we wrote with Hichel uh, Kim uh, rather recently. And uh, this paper, it it it. It is kind of a weird paper because it's a very, very, very short one, but it integrates in it a lot of results we have obtained over the last several years. And in particular, last time I have given a talk at this meeting about two years ago, I was talking about some of the results that I will again mention today, but I will arrive at them in a completely different way, in somewhat more general way. And uh, 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 and that's it. Okay. So, what is the the main motivation of this talk, or what, what I'm going to discuss? So, the basic idea is something I like to call a cross uh, dimensions duality. Okay. And uh, please uh, stop me at any point if you have any questions. Uh, so, feel free to just uh, say anything you want. So, what is uh, this idea of a cross dimensional duality? The idea is the following. The old idea or classical idea of a duality is that you start in some number of dimensions here denoted by D. You have two different uh, UV descriptions, this UV1 and UV2. You deform them by two relevant deformations, delta1 and delta2, and you flow to infrared to some quantum field theory. Sometimes it is an interesting conformal field theory, sometimes it might be a free theory or a gap theory, but you flow somewhere. So a duality, an IR duality for us is a situation when you flow to the same theory in the infrared. And by same theory, I really mean the same conformal manifold. I don't really care if you end up uh, exactly at the same locus of this conformal manifold, as long as the theories are continuously connected to each other by an exactly marginal deformation. And of course, by tuning the deformations in the UV, you can always uh, tune them in such a way that you really will hit at the same point. And there are various variants of these uh, types of IR dualities. For example, one of the theories in the UV might not flow at all. It might be a conformal theory by itself. So you have a description of this conformal manifold with a with a Lagrangian, and then you uh, deform it with exactly marginal deformation. And there is another description of the, the same conformal manifold where you flow. Uh, another type of a variant is when you have two different theories such that both of these theories are conformal. Okay, two different Lagrangians, for example, which describe the same uh, conformal manifold, and then you can describe any point of that uh, conformal manifold in uh, at least two ways. So no. this is the, the classical notion of uh, infrared duality no. and I, think I will Ami call has it a question. dimensional duality. Yes. Yes, sorry. Um, the, the, do you make any assumptions on the um, global form of the uh, conformal manifold, whether it's compact or not? No, it's not important for me. So all, all I care is that you there is a finite deformation, like in, in a sense, there is a deformation, like the two theories are finite distance away on the conformal manifold. Okay, so these are the situation I consider. I don't consider points which are infinitely far away. Okay, that I would not be sure whether I want to call this uh, theories living on the same conformal manifold. So that becomes tricky, but I will assume that the theories are uh, finite distance away using uh, the sure. usual metric. Okay, so this is a, the classical notion of duality, of in, infrared duality or conformal duality. And again, I will call these types of dualities in dimension dualities because the two starting points are in the same number of dimensions. However, we can generalize this, uh, these types of setups so that the two theories, the two theories we start with, uh, live in uh, different numbers of dimensions. So here we start with one UV theory, which lives in D uh, space-time dimensions. And we uh, place the theory on some compact geometry. And in the infrared, we flow to a theory in uh, less dimensions. In a similar way, we can start with another theory, say in D prime uh, number of space-time dimensions and flow to the same conformal manifold. So this D prime and D can be uh, different. 
Okay, so we have a generalization of the setup we have discussed before, where we flow across dimensions, but in the end, we describe again the same conformal manifold. So this setup I will refer to as a, a cross dimensional dualities. Okay, and everything I will say will uh, be in this framework of trying to understand the cross dimensional dualities and their relations to the um, uh, more well understood or well studied in dimensional dualities. Okay, so what are the goals uh, of this type of research? So there are many uh, goals. So uh, for this particular, for the particular things I'm going to discuss today, one of the main goals is to uh, systematize our understanding of in-dimensional dualities by studying across dimensional dualities. So we know a lot of in-dimensional dualities. There are many scattered results about these dualities. Some of the knowledge is systematized, for example, using brain constructions and so on. But but uh, we want some kind of a framework where all of these dualities uh, will be easily constructed and easily understood. Uh, and this across-dimensional perspective gives a lot of geometrical tools to, to do that. Another motivation is to systematize our understandings of other strong coupling phenomena. So these infrared dualities are usually associated with a strong coupling when these dualities are interesting, but there are other uh, strong coupling effects such as emergence of symmetry in the infrared and we want to understand it in the same uh, framework. And the third motivation is to better understand strongly coupled CFTs in general number of dimensions. So in this talk, we will start our discussion uh, in six dimensions. So one of the theories in this across dimensional do or pair will live in six dimensions. All of these th theories are strongly coupled as CFTs. And of course, we will study uh, supersymmetric theories to have some control over the setup. So these theories are uh, have various geometric and the string theory, M theory, and so on constructions. But we, it's fair to say that we don't understand them fully. So a question is whether understanding, say, all possible ways to compactify these theories to lower dimensions, where whether these types of understanding can teach us something about these strongly coupled theories in six dimensions uh, by themselves. So again, today, one of the sides of the dualities will be in six dimensions, and another will be in four dimensions. And the two theories, the one starting in six and one starting in four, will flow uh, to a four-dimensional theory. So this is the cross-dimensional setup that we will discuss. One side of the duality will be uh, will start with a strongly coupled CFT in six dimensions, and another will always start with a weakly coupled Lagrangian in four dimensions. And I will say a little bit more about it uh, soon. Okay, so. What we will concretely discuss, we will discuss an example of a cross-dimensional duality, which we by now completely understand. So we'll discuss starting in six dimensions from a sequence of, uh, of 6D 1,0 SCFTs, which are usually called minimal conformal matter theories of uh, D type. Uh, the, these theories are labeled by the parameter, by a parameter that I will call N. So we will uh, obtain uh, a cross-dimensional dualities for any choice of this parameter n, and we will be able to compactify this infinite sequence of uh, six-dimensional theories on any Riemann surface with any genus, any number of punctures, any types of punctures, and any value of flux. Okay, and uh, the a cross-dimensional dual, as I already said before, will be always a simple four-dimensional n equal one super uh, symmetric quantum field theory with a Lagrangian. So the examples we will discuss are in a sense extremely simple. So the Lagrangians that we will obtain, all of them are just usual vanilla Lagrangians in four dimensions. We will only discuss gauging of symmetries to build these theories which are manifest in the UV. Okay, sometimes one can uh, find this, such a cross-dimensional dualities when one engages uh, uh, emergent symmetries in the infrared. So this is something which goes slightly beyond what we would call Lagrangian theories. But what we will discuss today will be all completely uh, Lagrangian. Many of the dualities of the interesting dualities uh, that arise in this geometrical setup will be completely manifest in our description, as we will see. And that's, that has to do something with a star-shaped a star shape of various theories that we will find. 
And on the other hand, although these examples are very simple and maybe again simplest, and I will try to argue that they are even simpler than uh, across dimensional dualities that you might know from class S construction, this set of theories or set of constructions is extremely rich. We will see that one can uh, get a lot of different dualities and uh, a lot of examples of emergence of symmetry. And again, I, as I said in the very beginning, most of what I'm going to say is appeared in a scattered way in different uh, works in the past two to three years. But here we will see that there is some um, interestingly and surprisingly simple description of all of it as a sort of star-shaped uh, quantum field theories in four dimensions. Any questions about the plan? Yes, uh, if, if you uh, start with the uh, AA instead of DD, will you get something interesting? Yes, so with A-type, we understand a lot of things, but it turns out to be more complicated. So if you start with A-type conformal meta, we understand compactifications um, uh, with, uh, with particular number of punctures. Uh, we can uh, understand compactification, say, on, uh, on a tube or on a torus for a particular type of A singularities. For example, A1 singularity, we actually understand everything like compactifications on any surface. But importantly, these constructions involve gauging symmetries which are not manifest in the UV. Okay, so these are more complicated constructions. So there are many, many various uh, things that we understand. And the examples I'm going to discuss are really extremely simple. That is the, the special feature of them. And so not to mention about EE. So for E, we also understand something. So for E, we, we know uh, what are the compactification on a, a sphere with a zero or one puncture or, uh, or two punctures or torus with various values of flux. So we do understand something, but not everything. And again, a, a general understanding would involve gauging symmetries which are emergent. But, uh, well, actually, no, in that case, you don't need to gauge emergent symmetries, but the, uh, the sets of surfaces we understand is very limited. Okay. Okay. So before uh, discussing in detail the particular example, let me stress uh, a little bit more what I mean by uh, cross-dimensional duality, because I think it's, it's important. What, so what I really mean by having an across-dimensional duality is that I have two independent definition of uh, the same theory in lower dimensions. So one definition for us will be a little bit abstract. We will choose a 6D theory, we'll compactify it on some surface C, and that will define in the infrared some uh, theory in four dimensions. So it is one definition. Another definition will be using 4D Lagrangian. Okay. But and the, these two definitions exist uh, independent of each other. And that's why we have an interesting uh, statement of a duality, two different constructions giving us the same thing. For example, if you have only a 6D uh, theory, you can predict that there is a four dimensional theory you flow to, okay? And you can compute various properties of this uh, theory, but this is the only definition you have. Uh, of the theory in four dimensions through this uh, six dimensional construction. So it's true that one theory is four dimensional and the starting point, point is six dimensional, but there is no really duality, okay? To have a duality, we have to have two different constructions and that's what we will discuss, okay? So let, let me give uh, some of, uh, of the well-known examples of such dualities just to put things in context. So maybe the most uh, well-studied and uh, well-understood example is what is called A1 class S theory. So we take a 2,0 theory of type A1 and place it on uh, any Riemann surface you want. And uh, in this setup, you can understand any uh, cross-dimensional duality. This is in the original paper of Gavi, da David de Gaiotto from uh, uh, already many years ago. So here are the basic examples. You compactify on a sphere with three punctures. You get something which is just a collection of three fields, a tri-fundamental uh, of three SU2s. 
uh, the punctures, and we will use it later on, always are coming with some symmetry. This symmetry might be empty. There might be no symmetry. We will not discuss this example today. But you, you always should think of some symmetry associated to the punctures. And uh, there are various types of punctures which are called maximal. Again, we will mention it later on. That in this case, uh, have SU2 symmetry associated to them, and the maximal punctures are uh, related to compactifications of the 6D theory on a circle down to five dimensions. Basically, they are, uh, they are related to the gauge group you get in five dimensions. So these are the punctures. And then once you have a three punctured sphere like that, you can glue it into uh, Riemann surfaces uh, with different genera, with different types of punctures, and you get these uh, generalized quiver theories. So this is an example of a cross-dimensional duality that we completely understand. So in this case, if you uh, do things in, uh, in a way that preserves n equal to supersymmetry, these quiver theories, all of them are actually conformal field theories. So in, in the picture I drawn before, you have a 6D theory, you deform it by placing it on a Riemann surface, and then the Lagrangians that you build are describing uh, directly the conformal manifold uh, of the theory you obtain in the infrared. Okay. If you want to uh, generalize this construction to other types of 2,0 theories, there is no uh, generally an answer that we generally understand. So if you take uh, such uh, 6D 2,0 theories, place them on general Riemann surfaces, we don't know what the theory is. We don't know of a cross-dimensional duality. So again, the situation is that there is one construction of a 4D theory, but there is no other one. Of course, for special examples of compactifications, a lot is known. For example, for our Giras Douglas theories, we have Lagrangians. For the E6 uh, to uh, Minahan Emishansky SCFT, which is just A2 to 0 compactified on a three puncture sphere, there are various constructions. And here is uh, one of them obtained by Gabi Tsafrir a couple of years ago, whether, where you do have a simple Lagrangian. So this six is a field in the anti-symmetric representation of SU4. So there are scattered results, but there is no general answer known. And what we are after is this type of situation, okay, where we understand everything. Okay. Is there a question? Okay. So with this, let me start uh, the main part of the talk where, where I will present uh, the main results. So uh, first I need to define what will be the 6D theory that uh, we will start with. And we don't need to know much about it, but we need to know something about it. So the 6D CFT we are starting with is a so-called minimal conformal matter uh, of D type. So this theory is obtained um, by- it's a little hard to see, but I only see half of the last line at the bottom. Um, or like, yeah, there's a little bit missing. Is it possible to, ah, yeah, 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 so it is. Okay, is now okay? I see more. Now I see more. So do you see me writing now? Wait, sorry, one second. Yes. Yes, so this is the bottom. Yes, there yes, yes, now, now I see. Yeah, okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you. So the theories we are discussing are obtained by taking one M5 brain and, pro, uh, and placing into uh, dn plus three uh, singularity. So there is this parameter n which parameterizes this theory. So n for different n, we have a different theory in six dimension. So the things that we know about this, uh, these th theories in, uh, in six dimensions uh, are the following. For example, we know what the global symmetry of these theories is. So this is the global symmetry for a general choice of n, and for n equals one, the symmetry actually enhances to a eight, and this, in that case, the theory is called the E-string theory. Uh, if you take these theories and place them on a circle, you obtain uh, gauge theories, which are UV completed in six dimensions, and depending what you do when you compactify in a circle, you can have different types of gauge theories. So USP to n gauge theory, SUN plus one, SU2 to the n, and this, gauge groups in five dimensions, as I mentioned before, will give rise to different types of punctures in, uh, in compactification scenarios. So when you compactify, a puncture is defined by first going to five dimensions, thinking of the compactification as a long cylinder, cutting it and placing some boundary conditions. So depending on what type of a description you have in five dimensions, the 
the, the puncture will be associated with one of these symmetries. The main focus of this talk will be this uh, type of a puncture, and in the end, we will encounter also this one. I will not discuss these types of punctures, although they also can be discussed. Now, uh, you also the punct refer, yes. You also refer to the six dimensional theory? Say it again. So you talk about the five dimensional theory in this. Yes. Do you also refer to the six dimensional theories? So all of these theories, these five dimensional gauge theories, they are UV completed in six dimensions by this uh, minimal D uh, conformal matter theory. Okay, so I will compactify these six dimensional theories and I will compactify these theories on uh, surfaces with punctures. And I need to understand what punctures are and what types of symmetries are associated to the punctures. And that story is covered by five-dimensional compactification. So if you wish, a five dimensions is an intermediate, like a step in the construction of four-dimensional theories. So the, the realization as a six-dimensional theory with the finite string tension is not important for you? No, yeah, no, yeah. It, you know, some facts about these theories can be derived about, about, you know, from thinking about these theories in different ways. So what I will need is just very, very basic facts about these theories. What is the symmetry what, uh, in whatever way you will de derive it? You know, what are the, in, the 5D will give me the types of punctures. In principle, I would also want to know what are the, what is the anomaly polynomial of the 6D theory? what is the spectrum of operators and so on. So I assume somehow that was uh, given to me. I will not uh, try to derive it here, but I will take it as a given in whatever way it was derived. Okay, okay. okay. so this type, the, the gauge group of the five dimensional theory defines what is called the maximal puncture, but there are also other types of punctures and we can, uh, which have smaller symmetry, for example, uh, we can um, uh, start from a maximal puncture and using various field theoretic uh, operations. For example, if we are already in 4D, we can give vacuum expectation values to various operators, which are charged under the puncture symmetry, and we can decrease uh, the size of the symmetry. For example, if we'll start from USP to N symmetry, we can get smaller USP symmetries with a minimal choice being just SU2. So we will always have, and for all of these constructions, we will have a puncture which will have SU2 symmetry and we will call it a minimal puncture, okay? And in principle, we want to construct uh, compactifications for all choices of punctures, for all types of symmetries. Okay, Did so- you plug? Sorry? What was the word that you used in the previous? The bottom right is this flag, the last word. Punctures by flows. I'm very by sorry flow. for my handwriting, oh. but. Uh, oh, I see. Flow. Thank flow. you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so here is the basic statement of uh, of a cross-dimensional duality that I will make, and then I will uh, give uh, various evidences for this uh, statement, and we will discuss various implications of that. Okay, so we want an across-dimensional duality, so we need to start from one theory and show that it is equivalent to another theory, okay? So what is the first theory? The first theory is this 6D D-type minimal conformal matter theory, and we place this theory on a very simple surface. We take a sphere, and we put on this sphere any number of punctures. S, uh, the number of minimal punctures will be S, so we place minimal punctures and S of them. So the compactification is defined by two parameters. N, uh, the N is what is the starting theory. The theory will start within six dimensions. And what is, and uh, this number S, which de determines the number of punctures that the surface has. In principle, when we compactify, there is also a value of flux, which we will discuss later on. But for now, let me just uh, ignore it. Okay? But so the compactification is de defined by these two parameters. And then uh, we want to obtain another description of the theory in four dimension that we obtain in this compactification. And the claim is that this theory is extremely simple and it is given by this gauge theory. So this is not even a quiver gauge theory. It has a single gauge node 
the gauge group is determined by these two parameters, the number of punctures and the type of the 6D theory. So the gauge group is SU, S minus N plus 1. There, is, there are two S fundamentals. There are two N plus 6 uh, anti-fundamentals. So again, this S is related to the number of punctures. This N is related to the six-dimensional theory. And there are two fields in an anti-symmetric representation of this group. Okay? In addition, importantly, there is a superpotential with this general form. So we couple these two uh, anti-symmetric fields to the two uh, fundamentals Q, uh, which appear here. Okay, so the statement is that if you perform this geometric compactification or you start with this extremely simple gauge theory, you end up with the same uh, field theory or strongly coupled test CFT, in general, strongly coupled test CFT in four dimensions, although in some cases this theory will flow to infrared free uh, quantum field theory. Okay. So, Shlomo, yes. this is a Lagrangian theory, right? Uh, Completely Lagrangian theory. Yes, yes. and uh, I believe it could be described as a brain system. Right? You have two chiral multiplex in the symmetric representation? In anti symmetric representation. Ah, so these are anti symmetrics. Anti symmetric. And these two are fundamentals, and these are anti fundamentals. I see. Yeah, it looks like it could be described as a brain system. Do, do you know anything about the. I don't know about I, I didn't think about brain realizations in the moment. Okay. okay. If there is, it might be interesting to understand whether that brain realization somehow can be. Uh, let, let, let us discuss because, you know, I will get in a moment to star shapedness of this quiver. And of course, like in other examples of star shaped quivers in lower dimensions, brain constructions played an important role. I don't know of this. Uh, I didn't think about the brain realizations of this, uh, of this system, but and it might be very interesting. Yeah. But crucially, you have. Anti-symmetric, but there's no uh, bar of anti-symmetric. Yes, they, yes. For to cancel anomalies, these are the same types. Uh, there are two multiplets of the same type of the same chirality. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And okay. When yes. S is less than n, it just doesn't flow to any. It's something strongly. Some, that's right. That's that right. I, that's right. If S is smaller than n, is somehow you have you will see how it will maybe it will become clearer later what might go wrong but in some sense if you have not enough minimal punctures something is wrong about the theory i don't know what is wrong so this statement of course assumes that you know this whatever i wrote here makes sense if if s is too small i don't know what, what where the theory flows to presumably it is uh, some some bizarre theory but i don't know what it is Okay, it might be a theory with a gap, or I, I don't know what it is. So you, you have a label S in the superpotential, which is different from the S in the quiver, right? What do you mean, a label S? In, I don't see an S in this. This so is maybe, a superpotential. Maybe I need three. What's the, <laughs> what's the label <laughs> of the anti-symmetric? I. I? Yes, okay. there are two anti-symmetrics, A1 and A2. So we have, in general, uh, the most general coupling, uh, coupling, uh, you know, these anti-symmetrics and the pair of these fundamentals. Okay, thank you. <laughs> but please ask me this question because my <laughs> handwriting is horrible. Okay, so let me uh, now uh, claim that this simple uh, theory which uh, I draw here it actually should be thought of as a star-shaped quiver. And when we will complicate things, it will become more and more obvious that this is a star-shaped quiver. So if you look on the superpotential I uh, written a, on the previous uh, slide, uh, you have this uh, SU2S symmetry coming from rotating these fundamentals. And you turn on this superpotential and you can ask, what is the symmetry which is preserved by this superpotential? And the symmetry which is preserved is SU2 to the power S. Okay, so the, you don't completely break the symmetry, but you break it to some subgroup. You break uh, it to a lot of uh, SU2s. So you can think of this quiver, it's just the same quiver on the previous slide, but I just separated the, the two S into a lot of rays of this uh, star. Okay, so if, if you wish, this quiver that I am writing here, again, let me call it quiver, although it has only one gauge node, has exactly the same shape as the theory I claim 
it describes like the, the, the compactification surface on which I compactify the six dimensional theory. On. So the number of these SU2s uh, is equal to the number of punctures. But, okay, but so this is a non maximal embedding, right? There are plenty of ones. What happens to the ones? They all get mixed or something. Something happens. What do you mean? So SU2S has rank to S minus one. Oh, some of them are broken. Sorry. Yes, of course. Some of them are broken. So mm -hmm. some of the symmetries are broken by the superpotential. So, mm -hmm. but you you preserve a rank S symmetry. Rank S out of two S, S minus one. So it's exactly yes. Half. Yes. But you just break them with a superpotential. Just you need to analyze what is the symmetry which is preserved, and that will be the symmetry which is preserved. Okay. Uh, as so very soon, I will claim that actually this is not the only possibility. This is like the generic thing you will preserve, but you can preserve uh, larger non-Nambelian structures. I will discuss that soon. But you you preserve a rank S symmetry. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I will refer to this quiver as a star-shaped quiver for this reason. Okay, so this is, if you wish to be compared or to be contrasted with the uh, usual appearance of uh, star-shaped quivers in class S, uh, the way these quivers appear is when you take uh, a two comma zero theory and compactify it not to four dimensions, but down to three dimensions. And then you get quivers of this type. So again, there is a central quiver, which is basically determined by the central node, which is determined by the type of the 6D theory. And then uh, there are legs or uh, legs of the quiver, which give it the star, uh, the star uh, shape. Here I'm, I'm uh, writing a quiver with minimal punctures, but you can do anything. And there are a couple of differences with the quiver that I've written before. Of course, in, in three dimensions, uh, we are free to to add as much matter as we want uh, to to the gate to the central node, and we will get an interesting theory. We cannot do that in four dimensions. If we add too much matter, we get infrared uh, free theories. And note that although here the central node only depends on the six dimensional theories, and then the number of this rays depends on the number of punctures, here also the central node depends on the number of punctures. Okay, and that's how you can get interesting theories, even though you increase the number of uh, the amount of matter in this theory. Okay, so that is a conceptual difference between the well uh, known uh, star shaped quivers in three dimensions and uh, the theory I have uh, written on the previous slide. Okay, so next you can, this is a claim, I made some claim, and uh, we need to, to see how we can check this claim. So I will present several ways. Uh, we know that uh, that claim is correct. So first of all, I mentioned that the 6D theory has an SO uh, for n uh, plus 12 uh, symmetry for the general value of n. The quiver on this uh, slide has only SU2n plus 6 symmetry, uh, symmetries which are associated to the punctures, these SU2s. And actually, if you look uh, closely, there is additional U1 symmetry. So the symmetry which is not associated to the punctures is, is SU2n plus 6 times U1 which is the same rank as the six dimensional theory, okay? but it's a different symmetry. So the point is that the six dimensional symmetry of SO4n plus 12 is broken when we compactify to this symmetry and it is broken by two effects. First of all, we have punctures and various choices we make defining these punctures break the six dimensional symmetry. And second, we have a flux uh, for a U1 subgroup of the six dimensional symmetry that I ignored till now and I will soon uh, comment on, okay? And then we have this SU2 to the S symmetries which correspond to the punctures. If I claim that the theory I have constructed uh, corresponds to a compactification of a 6D theory um, on certain Riemann surface, I expect to have a certain number of exactly marginal deformations, which for example, will be related to the complex structure moduli of that surface. And you can analyze the uh, conformal manifold of the simple gauge theory that I have written down. And you can find that the number of exactly marginal deformation is S minus three, exactly as you would expect from a theory which corresponds to compactification on a sphere with S uh, punctures, okay? 
Finally, additional check that we can perform is a check of various dualities. Okay, we have a sphere with a lot of punctures. And uh, as we have learned from classes constructions, we can construct these spheres in different ways by different pair of pens decompositions as is uh, written here. For example, if we have a four puncture sphere with punctures that are labeled by A, B, C, and D, we can pair them in different ways and we should obtain uh, the same theories. Uh, usually, and in class S, this is an example of this, these types of dualities are very non-trivial statements. Okay, So this picture sounds trivial, but if you construct a quantum field theory at Lagrangian, which would build uh, these two theories, this, uh, the statement of this equality will be a non-trivial statement of a duality. Okay? However, in our con construction here, the duality which exchanges various types of punctures is completely explicitly manifest. Okay? We can just permute these legs in different ways and uh, the, the theory just is the same. Okay? It's it's not completely uh, completely trivial, uh, the statement that I just made, because uh, uh, what actually happens is that, you know, we'll have this S minus three dimensional conformal manifold. So only if we turn on, in some sense, very symmetric uh, choice of couplings, we can exchange this, uh, uh, these various symmetries. Yes, Philip, you have a question. Uh, yeah, I just had a question about the um, counting of exactly marginal um, yes. operators, it, do, do they have to match or is it possible that it could just be reduced? The number could be reduced from the counting and- Okay, in, this is an excellent question because I would say uh, as following. In general, I would expect them to match. For special compactifications, for example, if the number of punctures is too low, or the flux is too low. And again, till now I ignored uh, the flux. There might uh, happen special uh, things, uh, but there has to be an explanation, I would say, why the numbers do, uh, does, do not match. If you, you have a claim about, say, matching a sequence of compactifications, in general, I would expect that for general choices of parameters, uh, these numbers should match. There can be special cases when they don't match. I will say more about it in a couple of slides. Why, why do I expect them to match and why they uh, might not match in some cases? But in general, I would expect them to match. Great, thanks. But uh, how, how would you do this counting? What's the method you use to I will, in a couple of slides, I will uh, give an example of a method, but the method is completely standard. If you wish, you go to Lee and Strassler from 95 and just count, count exactly marginal deformations. And there are more modern ways to do to do that, computing a certain Keller quotient. Uh, you just write a set, uh, a list of all marginal operators and uh, you understand which, which of these marginal operators are exactly marginal and which are marginally irrelevant. So this is, um, this is one way, and I will uh, uh, mention a way to deduce this uh, from the index, which is uh, a very simple way, but it is equivalent uh, to all that. Okay, so I see. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, so again, what happens in, in these star-shaped quivers that you have this conformal manifold, and uh, if you turn on a very symmetric set of couplings, uh, you can exchange uh, these various punctures. So in a sense, with this, this very symmetric uh, choice of punctures, you flow to some very symmetric position on this conformal manifold, and then different pairs of pens decompositions are obtained by going exploring this conformal manifold, like going to some non-symmetric choices of couplings that I mentioned in the superpotential. Okay, so in this sense, the duality is manifest in the in the superpotential in the sorry in the quiver theory. It is manifest for the symmetric point on the conformal manifold, the, the, the symmetry of exchanging the punctures. But then uh, to go to different pair of pens, you need to, uh, to perform this operation. Okay, and again, you could say that in class S, when you go to three dimensions, there is also uh, this, issue, uh, this thing that you can exchange these punctures freely. Uh, however, the conformal manifold in three dimensions doesn't match with complex structure moduli. Uh, of the surface. The compactification is on a surface times S1. So the counting becomes very different. There are some papers on uh, uh, discussing uh, the conformal manifolds of 3D theories in, 
uh, obtained in class S, but uh, so the point is that these conformal manifolds here are very rich. They were explored to some extent, but there is actually a lot to do about this question uh, in 3D. This is just a side point. Okay. Now let me mention an interesting uh, fact uh, about uh, uh, studying these theories, these star-shaped quivers, and it has to do something which I will call collision of punctures. So I mentioned that we, if we turn on a generic superpotential, uh, we we obtain we break this, uh, this uh, the symmetry ro rotating for the fundamentals to su2 to the power s, but we can turn on non-generic superpotentials. And then what can actually happen that we can preserve larger subgroups of SU2S. In particular, let me give you an example. Let's take the number of minimal punctures to be 3N, where N is this parameter defining the 6D theory. Then we have an SUN, uh, SU6N symmetry rotating the fundamentals, and we can turn on a superpotential, which will preserve not SU2 to the power 3N, but actually USP to N to a power 3. And there are other choices also. But let me discuss uh, this choice. As I mentioned, USP to N is the symmetry of maximal punctures. So you can wonder whether these three USP to Ns that you obtain here correspond to maximal punctures. So this is the quiver you will obtain. Again, we make a special choice where S is equal to 3N. So the gauge group here is SU2N plus one. And we get three factors of USP to N uh, uh, symmetries. And the claim is that indeed, uh, this theory corresponds to compactifications of minimal DN, uh, DN plus three conformal matter theory on a sphere with three maximal punctures with USP to N uh, global symmetries. You can compute the locus of the conformal manifold of this theory such that this symmetry is preserved. And the dimension of that locus is zero, it's just a point, as you would expect from three, uh, from three punctured spheres. Okay. There are additional exactly marginal deformations, as we mentioned, but those ex additional exactly marginal deformations will break this symmetry corresponding to these punctures. So if you wish, the picture that you can have is that you have this theory that you, you, that you construct by having a lot of minimal punctures. It has a large conformal manifold, but then in some limits of this conformal manifold, these punctures can collide in a certain sense, and build punctures with bigger symmetries. So you can collide two SU2 punctures and build a USP4 sim, uh, type of puncture. You can uh, collide four punctures and build a USP8 uh, puncture and so on, okay? Such, again, collisions of punctures are not uh, very common in class S constructions, but these types of effects were also seen there. In the papers by Jacques Disler and Yuji Tachikawa, when one cons uh, cons uh, uh, considers twisted compactifications of various types and twisted punctures of various types. And uh, they call these types of collisions atypical, uh, uh, atypical uh, collisions of punctures, I believe. What, what causes the loss of the rank of the flavor symmetry by a factor of group? What do you mean? Uh, let's, loss go, of let's go back. So let's go back to your previous slide. So let's look at this, this one. We have yes. SU six n, so the rank is of order six n, and then in the other side the rank is three n. So we have factor two. So you are asking like how the superpotential breaks the. So ah, you see, so you're saying the source of breaking is the superpotential. It's always a superpotential. So the punctures, like if you have, if you turn on general superpotential, the symmetry is SU2 to the power S. So in this case, it will be SU2 to the power 3N. And this, this is the same rank as the rank of this symmetry. Okay, so okay. there is no additional loss of rank. There is a loss of non-abelian structure. If you go on a general locus of the of the conformal manifold, at special locus of conformal manifold, these SU2s form bigger symmetries, bigger USP uh, types of yeah. symmetries. There is actually a nice problem here. You could try to build a Hasse diagram, which will tell you the different patterns of breaking. Mm -hmm. That could be an interesting thing to try to compute. To see yes, I think here it should be really simple, just to analyze. The superpotential, which is one and like a two antisymmetrics with 
with two fundamentals and the superpotential is cubic. So just analyze, uh, you know, what, uh, how this breaks the symmetry. So and this and you have an expectation whether this will be a linear diagram or something more complicated? I didn't look on uh, how this diagram, like I didn't build a Hesse diagram of so this. Uh, okay. Yeah. okay. So there, there's this maximum, you can only get up to USP 2N. You can't put, you no, can't collide. Exactly, or... excellent question. So this is my, this is what you're asking. Okay, so let me get to it uh, in, in a moment. So uh, again, this is, much simpler than uh, before answering the uh, Philip's question. Let me mention that the picture we get is much simpler than you would get in a uh, class S in three dimensions, where to build more complicated punctures, you, you make these legs more complicated. So here you just play with the superpotential and you build uh, bigger punctures. And the, as Philip mentions, uh, you know, I, I'm claiming that colliding punctures, I can get bigger and bigger symmetries. And in principle, there is a symmetry, which is maximal one, which is collision of n minimal punctures. But in the construction we perform, there, is, there seems nothing special about n uh, collision of n punctures. You can get uh, bigger symmetries by colliding more of them. And I don't understand. This is quite a question. So I'm answering your question with a question. So this seems to be a field theoretical result that you know, there, there are corners of the conformal manifold of this theory which have bigger symmetries, bigger than uh, uh, the, 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 the symmetry you would associate to a maximal puncture. And you, if you think of these things as punctures and you study the size of the conformal manifold which preserves these symmetries, it is consistent with the interpretation of these bigger things as being uh, punctures. So I will call these punctures supramaximal punctures. I don't understand, uh, although I have some ideas that I will not uh, uh, raise, uh, you know, when I'm recorded, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't have a good understanding of what is the explanation of these punctures and whether they're indeed punctures or some fluke, some field theoretic fluke. Okay, but it's an excellent question. <clears throat> Sorry, Shlomo, is there, um, shouldn't the analog in A type should be the mirror of this one that you show? It should be the TN theory because it, you. That's right, but I don't, you know, the, in a sense, you know, because I have a star shaped quiver. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'm discussing the, the CFT. You know, whatever description you have, it's a description of that CFT. Mm -hmm. Since the shape of the quiver I have is a very star shaped quiver. I would mm -hmm. say that what I get is analogous to that. Since I'm in the lower supersymmetric case, I don't really, there is no canonical distinction between, you know, different mirror symmetry frames. So I don't, mm. you know, it's not. Uh, but in principle, you would like to draw some kind of non-Lagrangian stuff with three SUN symmetries sticking out. Like that would be the analog of the three, of the three USP 2N over here. Maybe, maybe you want right. to say that, you know, yeah. It's, you it's might this say part that, that becomes non-Lagrangian and... Maybe, you, you would, uh, yeah, you would interpret the, the picture in class S just becoming non-Lagrangian in this case. Yeah, and, yeah. And I want Why to push should... the analogy that it's really the star-shaped quill. Mm. So it's, you know, it's, it's just an analogy. It's not okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so since we have non-maximal punctures and we have supramaximal punctures, it seems, you can ask what is special about, uh, oh, sorry. What is special about uh, maximal punctures if we take a collection of N uh, punctures? And uh, the special thing is that if you compute, uh, for example, various anomalies uh, with respect uh, to say the R symmetry and the symmetry of these maximal punctures, the anomaly turns out to be such, it is denoted here by A, that you can take two such punctures and combine them and gauge the corresponding USP to N without breaking the U1R symmetry and the additional U1 symmetry that you have floating around. So the special feature of the maximal puncture from this analysis is that it is natural to gauge it without breaking uh, much of the structure that you have there, okay? So this is the special thing about maximal punctures, you can glue them. So let me discuss gluing. So there are different ways to glue uh, punctures. One uh, gluing I will call an, an phi gluing and another uh, gluing I will call S glue. So as I mentioned before, the puncture is really defined by first going to five dimensions and thinking of a theory on a tube 
and they placing some boundary condition, uh, cutting the tube and uh, placing some boundary condition at the tube. The 5D theory has various fields which are charged under the 5D gauge symmetry. So a natural choice of boundary condition, this maximal choice, freezes the gauge group, uh, the gauge fields on the on the boundary, and then we need to choose some Neumann or Dirichlet boundary conditions for various fields that we have. So let me call uh, uh, the fields we, for which we give uh, Neumann boundary conditions the moment map uh, moment map fields or uh, by abuse of notation. These are not moment maps in in the usual sense. What they become, they become certain operators in four dimensions. And if you look on the class S examples with n equal two theory, so this analysis is completely generic for any 6D theory. So these uh, operators that I call here moment maps really become moment maps in the case of n equal one theory, uh, sorry, n equal two theories. And then when we combine uh, two punctures, uh, we do two things. We first gauge a diagonal combination of the symmetry associated to the punctures. And then we need to turn on some superpotential. The gluing basically undoes that uh, boundary condition that we have placed. So we have frozen the gauge group. So we are gauging it. And also we have given some fields a Dirichlet boundary condition. So we need to undo that. And we can undo that in two ways. Other two introducing fields, uh, new fields into the system. So these are these fields phi. And they in the case of class S and equal to these phi's are the chiral, is, is the chiral multiplet in the n equal to vector multiplet. And because of this phi, we call this phi gluing. Or we don't uh, uh, introduce any new fields, but we identify the fields we gave Neumann boundary conditions here with fields we gave Dirichlet boundary conditions in the, in the other type of puncture. The important thing is that here we identify the symmetries of the two theories we glue together because of the superpotential. And here we identify the symmetries with conjugation. Okay. So in particular, if we associate some value of flux to this theory and some value of flux to this theory in phi gluing, we, uh, we, the, the flux we would associate to a glue theory will be just a sum of fluxes. And here it will be a difference of fluxes. And of course, we can con con uh, if we have various components of these moment maps, we can co consider uh, combinations of these two gluings, doing one sort of gluing for some component and other uh, sort of gluing for other components. So let me now S glue two uh, three puncture spheres that we have constructed before. So because uh, we are S gluing, the total flux we expect is uh, to be zero. Okay, we glue together two, uh, two trinions. The, the trinions has some value of flux, but the combined surface will have the difference of the fluxes since the fluxes were the same we'll expect to have a flux equal zero. Since we glue trinions, we expect to have a genus two surface. So these two halves are just the two theories I, I had before. So we are gauging the puncture symmetries, the diagonal combination of puncture symmetries, and we turn on some superpotential. So we obtain some very, very simple quiver theory uh, like that, which will describe a genus two compactification. And you can continue performing various checks of uh, this identification of a cross-dimensional duality. For example, you can compute A and C anomalies uh, from uh, the six-dimensional compactification and match those anomalies uh, to anomalies of this theory. And you find that these anomalies precisely match if you take uh, the flux of the compactification to be zero. The, the value of the flux affects the values of A and C anomalies that you will obtain in four dimension. And here the matching is for flux equals zero. Moreover, since this theory doesn't have any flux and it doesn't have any puncture, we expect the symmetry of this theory to be the symmetry of the six dimensional theory, which is SO4n plus 12. This theory has a symmetry in the UV SU2n plus six and uh, an additional U1 and these two factors are uh, identified by the superpotential. Uh, it is not clear that uh, this theory has the symmetry we expect, but that is the claim that uh, you will obtain a certain conformal manifold for this theory in four dimensions. And uh, on some sublocus of this conformal manifold, the symmetry will be enhanced. So this will be an example of emergent symmetry. And here is an example how you deduce these properties from looking uh, on the superconformal index. And here, for simplicity, I take the value of n to be equal to. So this is dn, d5 
comma d5 conformal matter, but you can do it for any value of n. So you compute uh, the supersymmetric index, and if you do so, and you look on a particular order in the expansion of the index in its parameters, uh, you find there exactly marginal deformations, or rather marginal deformations minus conserved currents. And here, uh, if you perform this computation for you know s gluing different trinions on a gen general genus G surface uh, to, into a general genus G surface, you find that there are three G minus three exactly marginal deformations, which you can identify with complex structure moduli. And this deduce naturally from uh, KK reduction of the concern of the stress energy tensor of the six dimensional theory. But you find additional marginal operators, which correspond to flat connections you can uh, put on this Riemann surface when you compactify. These are representations of SU10, uh, which is uh, the SU2n plus six in this case. And you see that these representations, which appear here of SU10 and the additional U1, U is the fugacity for the additional U1, build the joint of SO20, the symmetry you, that you expect in, uh, in six dimensions. So this is consistent with the enhancement of symmetry. And here I, I want to comment to, uh, about uh, Philip's question before. So these are the exactly marginal deformations we expect. Uh, they come from compactifications of the stress, stress energy tensor in six dimension, and this got, gives rise to the complex structure moduli. We also have the conserved current in six dimensions, and it gives rise to additional uh, exactly marginal uh, deformations due to these uh, flat connections. But in general, you it might happen that there are additional operators in six dimensions, which uh, which uh, give rise to uh, to mar exactly marginal operators in four dimensions, which are not these generic operators. Generically, I would expect for general general compactifications only these two to contribute, but we can might we might even have some non uh, like some surface operator which we can smear on the Riemann surface which give, will give rise to a local operator in four dimension and for special compactifications it will alter our uh, counting and it can even reduce the number of exactly marginal deformations okay if that operator uh, in some sense uh, recombines with uh, some of these operators to form a long multiplet and uh, then that deformation disappears in the infrared. But generically, the, this is what I would expect. C can you say uh, some words about uh, the reason you expect the coefficients of those specific terms to be counting modular? So the, you, you're asking about G minus one? Uh, first, there is this three G minus three. You're saying it comes in a very specific as a, yes, as a so the, this is a number of complex structure moduli, but you can understand it by just taking the stress energy tensor in six dimensions and integrating it over on the Riemann surface with general, it's just Riemann rock. You just integrate right. it with various functions and then, and then you predict the number of operators you will get in uh, four dimensions and this is the number you get. And the same is here. You just take the conserved current and do Riemann rock for the conserved current that you will what you will get you will get g minus one but since this operator is in the joint representation of the sum group you will get you know these times the the joint representation okay but if you um uh, think of it in the th these these numbers you extract from the index this is a computation of the index yes this is a computation in a four-dimensional theory so this is a computation in a in the 4D QFT, yes. And it so, matches six dimensional expectations. That so you're computing an index and then you have some fugacities and those are the coefficients of those. Yes, so this 99 is not a number, is the character of the joint of SU10 and so on. That's right. Uh, of course, yes, but that, that's given. Yeah, that's not the question. Okay. Sorry. The question is which, which uh, coefficient uh, this character is a coefficient of which term in the index? Oh, the same term. So there is a bracket here, it only ends here. It's in, it's the same term. It's the QP. QP yeah. coefficient. In yes, the I, I, I didn't give any details, but to, to make this statement, you need to use uh, the superconformal R symmetry. 
Okay, so it's implicit, in, like, it, you know, a QP term is an ill-defined statement. You need to specify with which R symmetry you compute the index. So you compute it with a, uh, with a super conformal symmetry here. And to relate to six dimensions, it's often uh, useful to use the six dimensional R symmetry, even if it is not a super conformal. Okay, and you also think of it as a, a, a gauge to the problem of uh, G adjoints coupled to this uh, symmetry of SO20 times SO2? So, so the computation, for example, for genus two would be just computing the index of this theory. Yes. But you see that the, the result of what you get mm -hmm. is, uh, is given by a gauge theory problem of G adjoints. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? But right? you don't, that's not, how, that's not how it arises here. It's a completely different computation. Mm -hmm. Okay, but that's what you get. Okay. Julius, I'm I'm very slow. So how many how much time do you do I have? How much time would you like? <laughs> like another less than 10 minutes? Would it be okay? That's that that would be okay, definitely. Okay. So I will a little bit speed up, but you can slow me down and then I will blame you for being fine. But uh, okay. I, 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 how about you just feel relaxed? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sure. Okay, so uh, here I here I drawn a, a very particular way to combine uh, the trinion into a, a genus to surface, but of course you can do it in different ways. So what I have drawn there is basically this picture, but you can also as glue in such a way, or you can take the four punctured sphere that we have uh, written before with four maximal punctures which I actually didn't write explicitly, but you can deduce it from what I wrote. And you can compute uh, as glue them uh, in such a way. And you always need to get uh, the same theory. And these are non-trivial statements and you can check them in various ways. And uh, uh, these statements are consistent, okay? Now, the next statement I want to make, till now I was uh, ignoring the value of flux. And in the S gluing, the flux didn't play a role because we always, combined uh, the same theories with uh, with the same values of flux, but with S gluing, so we uh, subtracted the value of flux. But now let me actually phi glue the theories. And the phi gluing is very similar. So if you ignore the red lines here, this is the same picture we had before. And the, these red lines are the fields phi that we need to, uh, to add when we glue punctures in this phi gluing. And in this phi gluing, we add the flux together when we co co combine two different surfaces. So we will obtain a compactification of this 6D theory we start with on the same geometry, on the same genus two surface, but with a flux which is not zero. Okay, this is a very different theory from the theory I drawn before. It, the matter is much more complicated, but it's still a vanilla uh, quiver theory. So you can uh, fix. One question. Yes. If you if you take the case of uh, genus one, and you yes. Go back to your previous formula. Uh, it would uh, give zero, G right? But yes. But genus the... one with zero flux. If you take flux to be zero and genus equal to one, it is a very special case. So, so what I'm doing is second. not covered by that case. Okay. It's a very, very special case. For example, in that case, you expect the supersymmetry to be n equal two. All of what I'm uh, discussing has n equal one uh, supersymmetry. Okay. And the index would reflect this thing or not? So the index, so when in that case, you have some symmetries which are in a sense uh, accidental in mm -hmm. the four dimension. It's like, you know, relating, obtaining an, the n equals four theory by compactifying two comma zero theories. Right. It's a very yeah. special case. If you do a naive reduction, use the generic formulas, which are true for generic value of G, you would, will get weird results when you put G yeah. equals one. You okay, call so it it's... partial Hixian, yes. Okay. Uh, okay, and so, and so, but, but so you're, you're saying you just, you just have to treat it separately. Yes, uh, that very, very particular choice is special. Um, Philip. Okay, I think Philip. Thank Philippe. you. Philippe. Also, thank you. Okay, so uh, so let me continue with this phi gluing. So since we this theory has now a flux which is not zero, we can deduce the value of that flux. We can do it in two ways actually. So we can match anomalies. Okay, we can start from a 6D theory and ask, 
you know, if I compactify on a genus two surface with some value of flux, what will be the ANC anomalies? And for different values of fluxes, I will get some values of anomalies and I can match that for some value of flux to the anomalies that I get here. I don't give here an explicit uh, formula because it's very ugly, but you can do that. Okay. Another thing you can do, you can compute the index again. The theory is now different. And the, what you find, you find that the number of uh, uh, operators in this order QP will be different. You will still have 3G minus 3, which you can identify with complex structure moduli. The flux doesn't alter that. Then uh, you, 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 the answer that you get in this particular case for n equal 2 for general G has this form. And then how do you interpret it? And again, the way to interpret these uh, additional terms, the terms beyond this term, is as Riemann rock reduction of uh, the conserved current in six dimensions down to four dimensions. Okay. And that reduction depends on the flux. Okay. Because this operator, the concert current, is, uh, is charged under the symmetry you gave the flux to, the answer that you will get will depend on the flux. So these coefficients here, here it's plus g minus one, here it's 3g minus three, here it's minus g minus one. This will be determined also by the value of flux. So you can determine the flux of the trinion by understanding these numbers here. And then that has to be consistent with the, what you will deduce from anomalies. So in some units, the conclusion here is that the flux uh, you obtain here breaks the SO4n plus 12 down to SU2n plus six times U1. And in some U normalization units, that will be uh, one unit of flux. Okay. Basically that will be the minimal flux you can. Okay. So let me finish uh, 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 very quickly with some comments about special compactifications and then about a most generic compactification. So in principle, we can construct any compactification and Ami caught me lying. So the only compactification we, we cannot, which doesn't fit this thing is genus one with zero flux. So that goes beyond this. So I should keep that as a... Uh, as a caveat, but beyond that example, we can co construct uh, any compactification. So for example, we can uh, study compactification on a two punctures uh, sphere with two maximal punctures. It's again, it's just take uh, uh, two N minimal punctures and collide them into two maximal punctures. So the quiver you will obtain is this type of a quiver in general. Okay, so there is some superpotential between these anti-symmetrics and uh, these fundamentals. Now, looking on this quiver, you see that it naturally breaks into a combination of two quivers, okay? Uh, where uh, you can think of each one of these quiver as uh, just a bifundamental of two groups, USP to N and SUN plus one. And if you remember the beginning of this talk, we had several types of maximal punctures. We had the USP to N maximal puncture, SUN plus one maximal puncture, an additional SU2 to the N puncture that I am not going to discuss. So it is very tempting to interpret this theory as the combining together two simpler ones. Uh, again, a two puncture sphere with two maximal punctures, but one puncture is a USP to N and one SUN plus one. So you come up with an additional conjecture that this theory corresponds, uh, this simple Wesumino theory corresponds to compactification on this surface. And now uh, what it gives you, it gives you the possibility to introduce a new type of puncture and build more types of compactifications with richer uh, uh, types of punctures. Okay. And understanding that this is a, a, a tube with some flux, which is not zero, uh, gives you a possibility to build more complicated surfaces. So let me maybe skip these examples. I can come the, back after we finish. I can. I want just to draw the most generic uh, star-shaped quiver that you can write from what we have discussed. So say you are interested in compactification of a 6D theory on generic Riemann surface with general genus, with general number of min minimal punctures. So the number of minimal punctures is S and the genus is G. So it's very simple to construct it immediately. You take uh, the theory we constructed in the beginning, this master theory we had, you take a lot of minimal punctures, 2G times N plus S minimal punctures. Okay? Then you group 
uh, some of these punctures into maximal ones, 2G of them you, you group into maximal ones, and then you glue them together to form uh, handles of the Riemann surface. And the rest you just keep uh, as they are. Okay, and then you obtain uh, a theory which is a cross dimensional dual to this compactification. Okay, so it is an extremely simple theory. It has the star shape, these are the rays of the star. And then you have the, the genera. Again, the quiver itself has the shape of the Riemann surface on, on which you compactify. So this gives you a compactification on a gen, general genus and general number of punctures, but not general flux. To generalize the value of flux, you can glue, uh, you can uh, group some of these minimal punctures into maximal ones and glue to them uh, two punctured spheres with various types of gluings to add additional flux. So what that will do, that will complicate the legs. The legs here are just simple, you know, just fundamentals, but gluing these uh, extra, extra tubes will make this... Uh, uh, these legs to a uh, longer quiver uh, legs by themselves. So in that way, you can construct any any theory you want. Um, okay. uh, sorry. Okay. So uh, let me summarize, and uh, then if you want, I can talk about the slide that I skipped. So the summary is uh, the following. So what we have discussed today is the construction of all across dimensional duals, modulo the one thing that Ami uh, mentioned, for a sequence of 6D CFTs, okay, for an infinite sequence of 6D CFTs. This is extremely simple and probably the simplest construction of such a sequence of across dimensional dualities. Everything is uh, very manifest. So most of the statements that I have made, for example, uh, the statement that this theory corresponds to a tube and various other statements appeared previously in different uh, long, very long papers uh, in the past. But with this understanding that everything comes from these star-shaped quivers, these statements have a very uniform and very simple structure. Uh, this, the fact that these things are very simple has to do with this star shape of the basic theory we obtain. Okay? In a sense, the shape of the geometry is, is the shape of the quiver, and the simplicity comes from that. There are things that I didn't have time to discuss. For example, there are relations between different quiver theories with different values of n. You can flow and discuss various flows from certain value of n to lower flow values of n, and these are additional consistency checks that uh, one can have. So we obtain here a very simple structure. So the question is whether this is special to the DD minimal conformal matter, or there is some there is a way to construct similar things for other theories. And again, maybe the main possibly technical, but maybe conceptual point here is that in these star-shaped quivers, the central nodes knows not just about the 6D theory, but also in, encodes information about the punctures. Maybe the generalizations will be that the central node will not be a simple node, but will be some uh, more generic structure, I don't know. And finally, the question I find most interesting, so here we have basically understand, uh, have an understanding of compactification on a generic Riemann surface of a sequence of six dimensional theories. So we know all the compactification. Can we now use the fact that we know all of this compactification to, in some sense to bootstrap the six dimensional theory? So if we just compactify on one Riemann surface, obviously a lot of information about the six D uh, mother theory is lost. But if you compactify in different ways, maybe you can retain different pieces of information, and then you can use all of these pieces of information to reconstruct everything you want about the 6D theory. Okay, so these are uh, uh, two of the open questions that I want to mention. And uh, thank you for your attention and your questions. And I'm sorry for going over time. Uh, thank you. Let's thank Shlomo. Do we have questions? Okay. So, so I have uh, a, okay. uh, I think it's 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 what you ask at the end, but a vague question like why would DD be so simple and why like and, and what's the like D 
this will be something like orthogonal of what is it that makes D simple and not the others? And, and how do you see the D type? I don't know, it's very vague. Uh, yeah, so I the answer to both of your questions, well, the answer to why is it simple, that I have a philosophical answer. Uh, anytime you have something in QFT, which you can classify by groups, if you have USP, it's always the simplest case. I don't know why. You know, go to cyber dualities. Go to USP duality is the simplest because of reality issues. I don't know what. It's not a deep answer, right? I don't know why it is simpler. I would like uh, to understand why it is the simplest. If you go to non-minimal D-type, uh, it's not that simple anymore. It's still uh, doable, but it's not that simple. So in this particular case, let me give another answer. So if you go to AD uh, type of singularities and you put brains on the, those singularities, if you put one M5 brain on A type singularity, it actually is very simple. The theory that you obtain in 4D is just a free theory. It's extremely simple. It's simpler than what I do I'm doing here. If you take one M5 brain on a D type singularity, that's the story I was discussing. You get something simple. If you get, if you do E type of single, e, like E type uh, theories, that will be uh, much more complicated. So in that sense, A is simpler, but D is interesting. Uh, but I don't know why. I don't have a good reason why. Because you know, is if you think about it, feel theoretically, it's it's a strong couple, strongly coupled theory in six dimensions. It's an SCFT. It's a non-trivial theory. Why? That is that one is in particular simple. I don't know. And the D shape. And uh, can you sharpen what you wanted to, like about the D? You asked. No, 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 no. That, that, that's it. But actually, I like the the answer. You when you say USP is always the simplest. I think uh, I agree with yeah. this. I, I think I know. I think Julius says also the the same thing usually. So I think there is a agreement on this. So. Yeah, I agree. I, I, that, uh... I learned this statement it's not my statement i learned it from nati but i'm sure many people say it all mm. the time okay no, no, but that's yeah. like... <laughs> even if you take uh, two, two ns planes on a singularity it will be um, it will still be having a feature of enhanced symmetry you you say two m5 brains on what singularity a type a type Yes, hey? it, will, it will have some simplifying features, but uh, more complicated than this one. Yeah, 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 that's right. So two and five brains uh, on A-type singularity, there are a lot of simplifying features, but it's more complicated than this. But you can say, okay, but this is two and five brain. And, you know, in some sense, the, this setup has only one and five brain. But, uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah. I mean, if, if there was something interesting with one and five on A-type, then that may have been the same, but it's not. It's just too simple. Mm -hmm. um, but I agree with, with uh, yeah, that, that, those are the simplest, simplest yeah. explanation to this. That's right. And, and again, I think they, they are simpler than A1 to comma zero. A1 to comma zero is again, is a two and five brains. We completely understand those theories, but you, you see there is no star-shaped quiver that we know uh, about them. So it, in that sense, it's more complicated. In this case, it's really simpler, although it's less supersymmetric. Very good. So um, do we want to see the, um, the slide you skipped for those that still have energy? You want to show us? Uh, yes, sure. Yes. It would be a shame not to finish. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> yes, it's only one slide, but we exactly can we can do that. <laughs> we can do that. So here I mentioned that we have this basic uh, uh, tube, uh, uh, which has two different punctures, as USP two n and SUN plus one types of puncture. So we can use this tube to glue it to various theories that, that I have constructed to, cons to construct interesting uh, theories with SUN plus one uh, punctures. And here is the simplest one. And this was actually the theory which was main focus of the talk I gave here two years ago, which, uh, which uh, appeared in a paper I wrote with, the, with Aviatar at the time. 
So uh, the point is, if you take a, a theory corresponding to two maximal USP puncture and one minimal SU2 punctures, and you glue these tubes to it, to, and you analyze the dynamics of the theory, the dynamic simplifies again to a simple gauge theory, which is nothing more than just an SQCD in the middle of the conformal window. Okay, so this is another type of simple uh, thing you can derive from this master theory. So 6D theory on a three punctured sphere with one minimal puncture and two maximal punctures, but of SUN plus one type is just a, an SQCD in the middle of the conformal window. The anti-symmetric fields that we had are gone because of, uh, of dynamical uh, issues. Like when you, you, you glue in these uh, two punctured spheres, you can do some uh, dualities, and then uh, in the infrared, uh, these uh, anti-symmetric fields will not uh, contribute. And the superpotential here is just zero. So it's really extremely simple theory. And this is the uh, geometrical picture of that theory. Okay. Another thing uh, I want to mention that I, I mentioned that you can derive various types of dualities. And some of these dualities are related to pair of pens decompositions. But here we also have a flux to play with. And the flux can give rise to uh, interesting uh, types of dualities. Again, this result appeared in various papers before. But uh, for example, uh, I think we can do, and here is an example of uh, taking n equals one. So the E string example, so where the SO16 symmetry enhances to E8. We can uh, consider uh, two basic tubes that I constructed before. So this, uh, th this tube becomes, uh, so for n equals one, both of these groups become a CO2. So we can glue uh, two such tubes together, but with a combined S and phi gluing. So these are the fields phi, and here I don't have them. So some of the moment maps I S, uh, S glue and some of them I phi glue. And the theory uh, you obtain has this value of flux. So what, how to think about this flux? So you have an E8 global symmetry, it's a rank eight symmetry. So you can turn on flux for any abelian subgroups for that E8. So you turn on flux, uh, one unit of flux for two of these you want, very particular you want, and you don't turn on flux for others. So that's the theory you will obtain. But this is just uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, this is wrong. Let me correct it. This is stupid. Okay, this is correct. Okay, so uh, I, I do this thing. And what you will obtain, if you look at this theory, this is SU2 with an F equals three. So you know that it is cyber uh, dual to some Vesumino model. If you do this analysis, and I wasn't very careful with, uh, uh, with free fields, uh, but you get uh, the theory which roughly looks like that, which is again, the theory that you would associate to a tube with two uh, maximal punctures in this case. So these two theories are the same. Both of them correspond to the tube. If you compute the flux, here the flux looks different. It's this type of flux. But actually, these two types of flux are equivalent inside E8. Okay? Because the flavor symmetry is E8, different looking vectors of flux can preserve the same symmetry and uh, can be equivalent. So if you wish, the basic NF equals 3 SU2 cyber duality in this context is the statement that these two fluxes are equivalent in E8. Okay, That's a very complicated uh, way to state uh, uh, cyber duality. And you can generalize this statement in various ways. What's the residual symmetry? It, uh, the residual symmetry here is E7 times U1. So you can uh, prove it. Just, uh, you know, this in a sense, uh, to write the flux in such a way, I use an SO16 subgroup of E8. Okay, and you can just uh, see what are the uh, roots of uh, SO16, which are orthogonal to any one of these uh, fluxes. And, uh, you know, to build an E8, you also need to look, look at spinorial weights and you look what, which spinorial weights are orthogonal to these guys. And in both of these cases, you see that you build any uh, any seven times a U1. Okay. How, what is your, um, like the first two entries for the flux, where do they correspond in the diagram? Oh, excellent. So, um, uh, so you see there is slight, okay. So a way to understand that, okay. Thank you for asking. 
So uh, uh, this is actually simple. Not everything is simple to explain, but this is simple to explain. So you see, the way to think about this theory is as two copies of this theory glued together. So there are these two bifundamentals that you glue together. So the way you build this theory, you take this theory with this value of flux and glue it to itself. But six of this US glue, you see you don't have a phi. So the flux will be with a minus sign. So there will be a half and a minus half in six places. So in total, the flux will be zero in six places. And in two places, these are these guys with phi glue. So the flux is the sum of the fluxes. So you get these two ones. Okay, so the, the flux that two are special is, is related to the fact that the fact that there is the two here and the six which behaves differently. But that's how you think about it. A much fun, more fun exercise is that to look at this theory, and this theory has the same value of flux, and to understand the why uh, what is here, like what is the two here and why you have zeros here. But that I Okay, that is a fun exercise to do. Okay, very nice. Um, thank you. I will clap again. <laughs> thank you for your attention. Very nice. We have more questions for Shlomo on the record. Oh, we're still on the record. Yeah, we, this was still on the record. <laughs> Still okay, have to be so let's, let's uh, end it now then, and uh, thank you.